Okay. So uh, for those of you who have uh, joined us before, welcome back. Uh, after the, you know, the, our short break, it's good to get 2021 started with a, with a good talk. Got that, Cooper? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear that. Thanks. Cooper. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. And uh, for those of you who are who are new, welcome. Uh, the house rules are uh, just just like in a regular seminar. If you have a question, just unmute yourself and jump in and, and ask the question. Uh, it looks like Cooper, you have at least one co-author in the audience. Is that true? I think I, I, I saw have him all earlier. Four of them. All four, in fact. Okay. Five. So yeah. then you can also uh, uh, ask questions in the chat room if you don't if you don't want to interrupt and maybe the, and then the uh, co-authors could could manage those. And then of course oh, we'll leave cool. the stream and then we'll leave the stream open afterwards uh, and just kind of keep chatting and let people make comments and uh, ask more questions then as well. Okay. So uh, without yeah. further ado, welcome Cooper. Take it away, you've got an hour. Okay, so this is a joint work with uh, Guan and Guan Liang and Ping, as uh, Kim said, they're in the audience. So I'm gonna start kind of in an unconventional way. Um, I'm just gonna start talking directly about the data. And I'm gonna use the data to both tell you what we're gonna do and to tell you what we're not gonna do. Um, so we're looking at <coughs> Chinese plant level data, manufacturing plants. And we're of course interested in the decision to export uh, or not. We're gonna be looking at uh, state controlled enterprises and private controlled enterprises. You can see that's the A and the B part of the graph here. So SCE and PCE forever after. And um, in these graphs, we're looking at average revenue labor productivity. So just simple revenue divided by employment. And I want you to focus on a couple of things associated with that measure of productivity, the distribution of it. So I guess first and foremost, um, these distributions are not degenerate. Some models would predict degenerate distributions, even if there's heterogeneity across the underlying um, plants. <coughs> Second of all, in terms of sorting between exporters and non-exporters, the black bars are the exporters, the white ones are the non-exporters, you can see there's considerable overlap in these distributions. Um, in the, in the uh, Bernard, uh, Eaton, Cordum, Jensen paper, whatever order it was, they also started with uh, distributions like this with considerable overlap. You don't see the kind of sorting that you might expect to see. Um, but again, this is average labor uh, productivity measure. And the third thing I want you to recognize is that we're splitting this stuff by ownership. Again, the state versus the private guys, that's a big deal in China, as we'll talk about later. Um, and there's overlap in both, in, in both of these um, distributions. I won't have time to get to it, but, but just like in the, in the Bernard et al. paper, the, the, <coughs> the overlap in these distributions is not a composition kind of thing. If we do this sector by sector, we see the same kind of, the same kind of um, overlap. So what's this paper about? Well, this paper is about the distinction, decision to become an exporter or not, and therefore about the sorting by some measure of productivity and therefore about the overlap um, in these distributions. Um, what I wanna focus on though, is first of all, kind of undercutting those graphs a little bit because we wanna argue that the average revenue labor product is actually not a useful metric for thinking about sorting in the export status. Um, and that's true for a couple of reasons. One, <coughs> The distribution is endogenous. It's not, ex it's not an, an indicator of exogenous differences um, across plants. It's endogenous because in our world, it reflects um, adjustment frictions because we're gonna be focusing on the significance of labor adjustment costs. In other settings, it may reflect um, heterogeneity and markups. We're gonna have heterogeneity in underlying productivity, various measures. We're gonna have homogeneous markups, but we're gonna focus on a setting where we have adjustment frictions, in particular labor um, adjustment costs. Moreover, when we think at least about sorting by productivity, we're sort of ignoring the fact that there may be also sorting based upon differences in the state of demand, or what we'll be calling demand shocks here. The average revenue labor product is by definition, it's revenue based, it's not a direct measure of productivity, it's got prices in there. So there's both the endogeneity of it and the fact that prices are there, 
it makes us think that this is maybe a good starting point for motivating the talk, but it's not everything we want to know about the determinants of export status um, in China. So what we're going to do here is to kind of push a bit, maybe on the traditional trade models, at least as far as I understand them, to introduce a couple of important features. One is factor adjustment costs. In particular here, I'm going to think about labor adjustment costs and not capital adjustment costs. Um, I understand there's probably arguments in favor of capital adjustment costs. There's probably arguments in favor of both of them combined. Um, computationally, we tried to solve a number of times the model with both uh, adjustment frictions present. We haven't made a lot of progress. So here we're focusing um, on labor. <clears throat> in addition, <coughs> In addition, we're going to have a, a, a wider set of shocks impacting our plants. In particular, foreign demand, domestic demand, and productivity shocks are going to group together, and that will determine through the plant level choice what type of sorting actually um, occurs. So we won't necessarily get strict sorting based on productivity because there may be firms with relatively low productivity, high demand on the foreign side who may be exporting, and we want to take that into account. And, and last but, but not least, um, we're going to be focusing on the split by ownership, again, public versus, versus private. In earlier work with Guan and Ping, we looked specifically at um, determination of the objective of the state controlled enterprises. Um, they're big players in China, obviously. They're big players when we think about trade war and, and interactions uh, with the US. And so we kind of want to understand what the state controlled enterprises are doing. And a big part of that is what do they maximize? In the earlier work, we decided that they actually maximized expected profits subject to some constraints and some adjustment frictions. And we're going back to that view of the world here. Uh, here we're though, of course, looking at the export decision. Um, again, are they different from the private guys in what dimensions and, and when does it matter? So um, we're thinking about retitling the paper, exporting like China, not like the textbook. Because in the end, this is not what I think is a standard textbook model of the, of the export decision. But maybe you guys will tell me. OK. <coughs> so besides coughing, what is, what is the approach here? Well, so we're going to have a model. It's going to be a dynamic optimization model. It's not a dynamic equilibrium model. Um, we're going to allow our plants to optimize with particular attention over their labor decisions and their export status. Um, there'll be a couple of key frictions as is standard in the trade models. There's some trade costs, which will be a sunk cost of becoming an exporter and an overhead cost associated with continuing to be an exporter. Um, in this way, not all plants become exporters and <coughs> some plants will over time decide to end their export status. In addition, um, we're introducing labor adjustment costs um, and we'll see the nature of those costs and their importance when we think about bringing the model to the data. We're going to bring the model to the data through a simulated method of moments um, exercise using the dynamic optimization problem as a basis for the model moments and taking some moments, um, particular moments from the data. The moments from the data we think are kind of informative about both trade and labor movements. So we're going to be looking at moments of both on both of those margins. And the estimation will distinguish the plants by ownership types. We'll basically estimate the model twice, um, well, maybe more than twice, but I won't tell you that. I'll report twice. And then we'll go ahead and do some counterfactuals, getting back to the theme of the paper, which is trying to understand the factors that determine trade status. And in part, that's gonna be switching on and off the various frictions and switching on and off the various sources, uh, variability in, in, in the profitability of the enterprises, that is demand versus the, um, the productivity shocks. And then we're gonna to try to kind of evaluate the contributions of the trade and the labor frictions to the matching of the moments and, and, and to other moments. Um, what are we gonna find? <coughs> Um, the productivity overlap, the lack of sorting that you saw in terms of average labor productivity will carry over to another measure of productivity that actually, based on work I did years ago with Halty Wenger, we think more of as a profitability measure rather than directly productivity. 
Uh, the measure of profitability includes both demand variations as well as um, productivity variations. So when now, when I say productivity, you can also think profitability. And the overlap is due to labor adjustment costs, we argue, and the presence of demand shocks, and much less due to sunk trade costs. And this is even the case if we control for plant age. So we just look at young exporters and see the sorting by young exporters. It's not that these frictions are not statistically significant. Um, they are. But when we turn off the trade frictions, the moments change very little compared to when we turn off the labor adjustment frictions. And I'll, and I'll show you that as we go on. Um, and ownership matters. Ownership matters in, you want to say hi? Okay, say hi. Ownership matters in, in lots of ways. Ownership matters partly because the parameters are going to be different. Adjustment costs are going to be larger for the state-owned enterprises. And we estimate the discount factor. And state-owned enterprises are generally much more patient. That was true in the earlier work, and it's true here as well. There's implications of this for sorting. You're going to see the sorting is much better for the state-controlled enterprises. And of course, ultimately, when we get to the next paper on trade wars, um, <coughs> ownership is going to matter in terms of interventions and, and so forth. OK. Um, I was told at this seminar there was a tradition to cite the literature and that I had to cite two of George's papers. Um, so George, they're over here on, on the right side. Um, I would say this project is kind of a, I don't know, like a, a comics combination of what's been sort of done a lot in terms of dynamic factor demand in standard macro models, which in many cases is partial equilibrium and it's, and it's dynamic stochastic optimization at the plant level combined with the <coughs> attention, obviously in the trade literature to firm level, he level heterogeneity and the sorting into, into export status. Um, there are some papers, you know, one by, by Gunnar Thibault, one by Mahamid, export dynamics with input frictions. And so we're not the first to introduce sort of labor adjustment costs, but here we're looking specifically at the sorting. And again, at this, at this distinction between the public and the private. Um, and of course, I had to cite Kim's work. So there's the Rule Willis paper about new exporter dynamics. And we actually have stuff to say about that. Um, not so much in this paper, but in, in, in other notes. But we'll come back to the, ex the young exporters in, in a little bit. Anybody have any questions? Want to say anything? OK, OK, OK. Sorry. Sorry, actually. Excuse me. When you look at the, when you say that something matters for the moments, are you going to be focusing on the productivity distribution that you were showing before, or are you going to, are you, are, do you mean like a broader set of moments, like export participation yeah, so, yeah, rates? So we're gonna, yeah, so I'm going to, I'll show you in a minute exactly what the moments that we're using for the simulated method of moments exercise. It ends up, we're not using moments of that productivity distribution directly. Uh -huh. But once I estimate the model, kind of, let's say in an informal over-identification exercise, I'll generate those distributions, model-driven ones versus data-driven ones, and we'll get back to the, the comparison. Um, okay, thank you. We could have gone the other way. We could have included some, some quantitative measures of the, the lack of sorting as well in the target moments, but we chose not to do that. OK, um, I guess I have to be mindful of the time. Oh, boy. OK, so we have a bunch of data. We're looking at 2005, 2007. This is uh, plant level data. <coughs> it includes observations on all <coughs> the public plants. And the private plants with revenue exceeding a, a, a cutoff. And we mimic this when we do with the simulated data where we sort of kind of have a, a version of the cutoff on the private side that sort of reflects the cutoff um, in the data. Exporter status is year by year. You earn some revenue by exporting and we call you an exporter. And ownership is decided by who controls the particular plant. And we're looking at a balance panel in the sense that the state controlled enterprises are state controlled enterprises for the entire window of time, 2005 to 2007, and the same for the, for the private guys. So we're not focusing on ownership changes here. Um, we have some summary statistics, which, which are reported here. You can see the number of plants. <coughs> By the time we're in 2005, 2007, you know, there's a lot more uh, private controlled enterprises than, than, than public ones. In terms of employment, the public ones are, are much larger um, overall. 
we have more exporters on the private side and a higher fraction of plants who are exporters um, on the private side. By various measures of, of, of productivity, like revenue per worker and value added per worker, uh, the, the public guys are, are, are productive. It's not the case that the public guys are these huge unproductive plants. That was the case a long time ago. It's not the case um, any longer in China. If you look at value added per worker or revenue per worker, um, for the state controlled enterprises by that measure, the exporters are, are, are more productive, but the exporters are less productive on the, on the private side by those, by those measures. Um, okay, this, but, but this is not a, something we're gonna focus on per se in the sense of these particular moments. So let me just push on. Here's a subset of the moments that we are gonna focus on. And I um, split this up into sort of those that kind of summarize labor patterns and those that summarize um, trade patterns. Um, on the labor side, we're looking at kind of the extremes of job creation and job destruction. So job creation, job destruction refer to changes in employment divided by the stock of workers in the previous period. <coughs> so job creation rates in excess of 30% and job destruction rates in excess of 30%, big changes in the number of workers. And then inaction, which is very near to zero um, employment change. Russell? In the day a quick question from the previous slide. You, you were showing the exporters were less productive among the private ones, which right. sort of reminds me of uh, Dan Liu's paper. But then in your, in your figure at the, at the very beginning, it, it just eyeballing it looked like, I thought there was a bigger shift to the right among the exporters for the private ones. So I will... Is that yeah, can I come back to that thing? Because we'll have a, we'll have a section in a minute devoted to profitability measures and their distribution. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So <coughs> there's obviously many other moments we could put on the labor side, but this is sort of getting the big labor adjustments and the and the inaction, and that's going to be relevant because we're going to have some non-convexity here in the labor adjustment process. We're going to be looking at the exit rate. That's gonna be reflective of overhead costs. And then we're gonna look a little bit at the size distribution by looking at median and mean um, sizes of public versus, uh, versus private enterprises. In terms of the trade patterns, we're gonna be focusing on the flows between export, non-export, and from non-export to export. So it's sort of getting at the dynamics of the export status. Um, we're looking at the fraction of exporters, size weighted, the average share of revenue, and we're looking specifically at the fraction of small exporters, getting at the idea that some of these plants, even though they're exporting, are exporting less than 5%, um, less than 5% of their revenue is coming from um, foreign sales. So I think these are pretty common kind of moments to look at in, in the trade literature. Um, there's more, but that's a good starting point. So let me briefly describe our um, dynamic optimization framework. Capital Omega here represents the current state of a plant. And there are going to be a couple of uh, stochastic elements. There's going to be Z, which is productivity, which is like a common to all the operations of the plant. And then there's going to be demand shifters for domestic sales AD and foreign sales AF. Of course, the foreign sales won't matter if the plant is not a, a, an exporter, but it'll be there anyways in the state space. The previous stock of workers will matter to us because of adjustment costs on the labor side, and the previous export status will matter for us because there's a cost of becoming a new exporter. A plant in state Omega can choose to be, sell only domestically, domestic and foreign, or can just exit, exit the market. Right. But just, to follow those to, options. Uh, just to follow on to Sam's point, um, is there anybody in this model that based on, you know, the, the moments that you've estimated that would want to export but not sell domestically? Or is that uh, not no. something that would ever happen in equilibrium if you, if you allowed right. for it? I don't, I, Ping, and, Ping and, uh, and Guan and Guan Leong can come and I'm pretty sure that's not a prominent feature um, of the data, but okay. I think there are in China these kinds of plants that sort of buy up, import a lot, do a little something to it, and then then export it kind of quickly. And I think we sort of controlled for those at some point, excluded them, and and, and they weren't a big factor in, in the moments that we were looking okay. at. 
Okay, so um, these are the three options spelled out. Um, if you're a domestic seller only, then your only choice is the number of workers E, and you get some revenue from those workers. That's given by the, the first function here that I'll detail in a second. There's a overhead cost of operation. That's what's around for exit. This is just your labor, your labor bill. This is your cost of adjustment function that I'll describe in a minute. And then next year, which you discount at rate beta, you're in state omega prime. And everything we do is going to be a first order Markov process. And we'll estimate that process um, from the data. If you choose to sell in domestic and foreign markets, then you choose how many workers. You choose how to split your workforce between the production of domestic goods and foreign goods. You get the sum of the revenues from those operations. AJ is the demand shock. So it's A, D, and A, F for the foreign market. This is your cost of, of, of exporting, an additional cost there. The adjustment costs are present regardless. This chi here is the cost that you pay if you were not an exporter last period, and then you continue. And if you exit, you just fire all the workers and you go away. Okay, so, so that's the you can, Yeah. Go ahead. I, you can so you can move your workers across. You're thinking about there being kind of like two different technologies you're operating here to be foreign and domestic, or what's the deal with dividing <coughs> your guys up? So we pay a common cost of of, of getting the workers, mm -hmm. and then we're assigning them to either domestic production activity or foreign production activity with the same. So are you asking whether it matters whether we think about sorting the workers between activities or sorting the goods between markets? Something like that. Yeah, this, uh, that's a somewhat unusual uh, assumption. So I'm just curious if you're getting some mileage out of it or... No. I guess another what, what would happen if you just... Like what would happen if you just had one plant, you dumped all the workers and they produced a bunch of stuff, and then you chose how to price it and where to send it. Would that, would that be any... Because there's no friction, right, to moving guys around between the exactly, plants. Exactly. So I think that's probably morally equivalent, but we didn't write it that way. Okay. An another way to ask this is, do you have constant returns to scale at the plant level or no, or decreasing returns? We do have, in, in terms of the technology, you can think about us as having constant returns to scale, but okay. you have demand curves with different elasticities. Sure. Yeah. yeah no, so I the revenue that. that you're going to get could be different, but the, yeah, exactly. on the production side, it probably doesn't matter. Okay, it fine. doesn't matter. Right. Okay. Right. Then it's right. Okay. Good. So, Thanks. So, just to follow up, since you anticipated um, Kim's new exporter stuff, I, I don't see anything in here that would sort of lead me to kind of ramp up my foreign sales slowly. Um, no. Which is kind of no. a key feature of the data. You're going to just kind of jump in at scale. If anything, your your export intensity is going to fall with with time in the marketplace because well, yeah, I'm so expecting I expect it to fall. I'll show you that a graph of that in a second. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll show you a graph of that in a second. The graph's going to be a graph about employment as a function of how long you've been an exporter, not revenue share, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess people have been looking at the revenue share. And we've had. Yeah. Uh, you can go back and look at some talks um, from from earlier in some, uh, the series from Joe and Is Dorian it, about looking at the China data. No, just you know, it's it's the same everywhere. You know, firms kind of their export intensity kind of grows slowly. When they enter into new markets in general. Okay. Okay. So we it just speaks uh, to like a different a different technology. Yeah. Okay. So we should talk about that yep. in the informal session. Sounds good. All right. Um, because that's not quite okay. So anyway, so what are the key components? I think I've said them. There's the trade frictions, the labor adjustment costs, the different curvatures and the revenue functions, and of course the stochastic processes. So let me now say a little bit about, about the bottom three. I've already talked about the, the cost of becoming an exporter. Um, <clears throat> admittedly, this may be overkill, but we threw the kitchen sink at, uh, at the model in terms of, of, of labor adjustment costs. And what I mean by that is we have fixed costs, we have linear adjustment costs. So there's a cost here of firing, which you might think is a severance pay kind of thing and a quadratic adjustment cost as well. In the earlier work with, with Ping and Guan, we didn't always have all, all of these, um, but they're here and, and, and we go ahead with that as a way to try to characterize not just, not just the employment distribution, but of course, 
these adjustment costs have implications for what you do as, as your export status, um, the dynamics of exporting and so forth. They all factor into those, into those uh, decisions. We are now in the process <coughs> of estimating a simplified version of the model where we cut out some of these costs, um, but I'm not gonna report that to you now. So I think about the revenue function is coming from a combination of a CRS technology and a constant elasticity demand. So alpha J here will be the, the curvature of the revenue function for market J, okay? And AJ is the shock out here. So this is the revenue that you get and Z is your technology um, parameter. We're gonna allow the curvatures to differ by market and also allow them to differ by ownership. So state-owned enterprises versus the private controlled enterprises may have different elasticities. Um, and then of course, there's a static optimization problem that's solved that we just described over the allocation of workers between the two markets, between the, between the two activities. And we don't have any adjustment costs there. So there's no adjustment associated with the allocation of workers uh, across, those, across those activities. <coughs> we have a stochastic process for productivity, domestic demand, and, and foreign demand. Um, the standard deviation here, these are not indexed by time, so there are no dispersion effects or uncertainty effects or any of that going on. Um, these processes are all built into the dynamic optimization at the plant level just by taking you know, the talc and procedure and a discretization. The innovations here are by assumption orthogonal but keep in mind that there's some jointness here because the productivity affects kind of all operations because it affects the productivity of the workers at the single plant before the stuff gets dispersed um, to, 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 the two different, uh, to the two different markets. And we're gonna be backing out or estimating these processes in the simulated method of moment exercise. And, and I'll come to that um, in a minute. So how are we gonna estimate this? <coughs> so simulated method of moments, solving everything uh, value function iteration style. Um, we're gonna be over identified. There's some attention paid to identification issues in, in, in the paper. Uh, we computed standard errors um, for the parameter estimates. The estimation had multiple starting values. Um, there's a matrix presented probably in the appendix. It's a huge matrix describing the partial derivatives of the moments with respect to the underlying parameters. And then I think most importantly, from the perspective of the economics, we're going to do some experiments of turning stuff on and off so you can get a sense of how the model fits as we, as we go to that. Um, I want to be a little more thoughtful and careful and slow down just a tish to talk about the parameters um, and, the, and, and the moments. There are a lot of parameters, which is why we had to use a computer to, to actually solve this thing. So there's a whole bunch of adjustment costs up here. We're estimating the discount factor. This is something I've done in, in many studies now on the, on the plant level optimization and household level. Somehow there used to be this taboo against estimating discount factors, like you can't identify them. For me in my experiments, it's just the opposite. You can't not identify them. They just drive so much. Okay, so as you can see here in the parameters, we're gonna uncover the serial correlation and the standard deviation of all the stochastic processes, the foreign and the, um, and the domestic shocks. The foreign shocks are down here, but the domestic ones are here because they're common to everybody. On the exporter side, a key thing is gonna be CHI, the cost of becoming an exporter. And then here are the, the stochastic processes. Now, I think we all know that, um, maybe it's an embarrassment, but one of the struggles of our profession is actually estimating revenue and production functions. We're still trying to figure that out in a convincing way. And you might wonder, what are we gonna do? So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna, we did this in earlier papers. Um, we're gonna do OLS estimation of the revenue functions. So see this parameter here, for example, <coughs> this alpha tilde D. This is an estimate of the curvature of the revenue function solely for plants that just sell domestically. Now we don't think this is the structural alpha. We understand omitted variable bias, or at least my co-authors do. Um, but we can still use this as a moment 
and then try to uncover the actual curvature of the revenue function from the simulated method of moments approach. That's so look, you see here, there's an alpha tilde D, that's the OLS estimate of the curvature. And up here, there's an alpha D, which is the, an alpha D, which is the structural curvature of revenue. They're not gonna be the same, but the OLS is gonna be informative about that underlying curvature along with other things. And the estimation is gonna allow us to uncover from these moments that you see in front of you, the underlying structural parameters. So the identification is, is, is kind of you know, important in, in, in that way. Okay, so, <coughs> so if I look at domestic revenue, I can just basically do OLS estimate of revenue as a function of, of labor input in logs, uncover a residual, call that, we label that the profitability shock for now, and look at its zero correlation, its standard deviation, and these become moments that we're gonna match. So, so beyond the labor to... adjustment stuff and uh, um, the trade flows, there are these other ols -y kind of things that are important. So Cooper, back to my first, my original question. So when you're estimating these things, what are the inputs? Do you, you, do you somehow observe how much labor you're using to, to produce revenue from exporting? How are you gonna, no, what, what are you guys doing there? <coughs> Give me a second, that's the next slide. Oh, you're gonna show us? Okay. I'll show you a little something, not much. Okay, so um, estimation challenge, getting at these, at these revenue functions. So the problem is, of course, that we, while we observe revenue by source, we don't observe <coughs> how the workers are allocated um, between different activities. We don't know those shares that we talked about before. So as I said, we can still estimate the revenue function for the non-exporters, domestic sales only. We can also sum up total revenue and estimate it as a function of the total labor input for the exporters. And that's what we do. And that's what generates the OLS moments that I just showed you a minute ago. Then we can back out from the indirect inference simulated method of moments approach, the structural curvatures and the parameters of those shock processes. And that's how the estimation proceeds. So the inputs, I think this answers, I hope this answers your question. We do observe revenue, we do observe employment, right? And those are the inputs into this part of the, the estimation process. And we do the OLS estimation using those, using those inputs. Okay. Um, <coughs> so this is another place to pause and take a question. We're good? Okay. Um, I won't go to the detail yet. So there's a lot of stuff here. Um, these are the moments. So I've kind of taken you through the, you know, the labels here, so to speak. These were the actual data moments in this column for the state controlled enterprises and the data moments here for the, for the private guys. Some of these you've seen like average size, um, mean size and, and, and median size for the state controlled enterprises and the, and, and the private guys. Um, you know, these are the labor adjustment moments here. So let's look at that for a little bit. About 15% of the observations have essentially no adjustment in employment. This is, this is um, so we only observe the number of workers at a plant one year after the next, right? So we're just looking at stuff that's netting out gross flows. We don't observe gross flows. We only observe nets. So this is like 15% have no net changes. If you look at the inaction rate on the private side, it's almost twice that. If you look at bursts of employment on the private side, like job creation rates, about 17% of the time, it's in excess of 30%. So big, big movements there um, on, on, on the employment side. Fox is the, is, is the fraction of exporters weighted by employment weighted. So you can see it's pretty high, but it's even higher on the, on, on the private guys. Um, the small exporters is the, fra is the employment weighted fraction of workers um, in firms that have a small amount of export. And you can see that's pretty high for the state controlled enterprises, much higher than the, than the, than, than, than the, than the private ones. Okay, that's sort of like the export stuff. Here's the non-export stuff. You get a sense of the dynamic here, right? 3% of the non-exporters become exporters in the next year on the, on the public side. On the private side, there's more action. It's almost double that. And it's almost double that on the way out 
Um, where's the way out? It's right here. No, sorry, it's about the same on the way out. Export to non-export is about 10% on both sides. So the column labeled baseline is our baseline estimation, the one I just kind of described to you. Um, down here are the statistics describing how good, how well the model fits the data. Um, the number says 4,319. We didn't test if that was significantly different from zero or not. Um, my suspicion is that it's probably not zero, but you know, a model is a model and, and, and you get what you can get. Um, <coughs> The other two, in a more serious vein, we discuss in the paper, obviously, ways in which we, we do and don't match certain things. I mean, we are getting the sizes pretty well uh, here, right? We're getting the, the, the job creation, job destruction um, pretty well here as well. Okay. There's two other columns, no sunk and no AC, which I'll come back to in a minute and, and, and describe. But one cuts off the sunk trade cost. One cuts off the labor adjustment. And we kind of look at those. Um, right, so these are the, like, the parameter um, estimates. Sorry, they, uh, it seems like one place where you're not doing so well, and I just wondered if there's uh, information there is on that alpha tilde D, you're not. Yeah, right? yeah, Sam. That Jeez, one Sam. It seems to be telling you something, I don't know what. Yeah, so um, like here, right? Actually, yeah, the so the alpha tilde. versus 1.2. The lower one in the non-exported. Yeah, yeah. So for the state controlled enterprise, we're way off on that, right? Actually, for the private guys, we're doing pretty well, right? So I know you want to look for things that we're having a problem with, but I'll just respond by saying things that we're doing incredibly well with. Um, yeah, so Sam, <coughs> the way I think about this, right, is this is sort of capturing omitted variable bias in some way. And we're getting a lot of omitted variable bias here that's driving this thing way up. A lot of correlation between the profitability shock and employment on the state control guys that's driving this up. And it's a little bit surprising, right? Because it's, um, there's large adjustment costs here. So yeah, that's something that we're, we're definitely missing on. So related um, to that, Cooper, you're not, you haven't said anything about state controlled enterprises being somehow different from private enterprises, besides the fact some structural to. parameters might be different. That, that's why yeah, I, I think that, uh, to add on to that, they, the idea that they could potentially have different adjustment costs makes an yeah. awful lot of sense to me based on like different access to financing, that kind of thing. Well, yeah. So we, 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 one thing at a time. So Kim, that's why I was at this parameter, this table six. I want to talk about differences between state controlled and private guys. And yeah, <coughs> in, the, in the earlier paper that Guan and I, Guan Ping and I published, we paid a lot of attention to differences in those adjustment costs because partly in China, it's not just legislated costs. It's sort of the, the bureaucratic hassle that you have to go through. And, and, and we also interpreted the larger adjustment costs from the state controlled enterprises, which I'll show you in a second, as reflecting kind of their, yeah, their profit maximizing, but they see constraints that maybe the private guys don't see about in the goal of employment stabilization, which might be reflected in quadratic adjustment costs and on and on and on. So just a couple of things on, 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 on here, and then I'll talk about the adjustment costs in a second. You can see, first of all, that the state controlled enterprises are much more patient than the private guys. And these numbers are about the same that, 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 that Ping and Guan and I found in, in, in our earlier study. Um, this chi is like relative to average revenue <laughs> is the cost of exporting. And I'll, I'll come back to that um, right now. Wait, I want to show you something. Hang on there. Yeah, so these are the, the frictions relative to average revenue. So this table kind of allows you to make a better, a better comparison. So this is the fixed cost of exporting. And it's about the same between the private and the, and, and the state controlled. This is the cost of becoming an exporter. It's also about the same. These are the fixed adjustment costs, and they're much, much larger for the state controlled enterprises than for the private guys. And if I go back, sorry, if I go back um, to these parameters, these are the linear um, adjustment costs here. And you can see that the linear adjustment cost associated with firing is much larger for the state controlled guys but the one associated with hiring is much higher on the, on the private side. 
Now, you know, and I know that in some models, you can't distinguish hiring costs from firing costs. But it turns out that that depends a lot on how impatient these, these plants are. And at these levels of beta, you can, you can identify, you know, identify these things. Okay, so it looks like I don't have nearly as much time um, as I wanted to have. That's always the case. So um, let me just try to hit on a couple of, of, of key points. So <coughs> before I get into the determinants of trade status, let me just say one thing. We wanted to understand the relative contribution of the labor adjustment costs versus the, the trade frictions. So what we did is we turned one off and then we turned the other one off. And we did that first in the estimation, and then we'll do it again and again and again, more times than you want to see in the in the counterfactuals. So if I go back up here to our um, main table of moments, this exercise here set chi equal to zero. That's the no sunk, and the exercise called no adjustment cost. <coughs> that set all the adjustment costs to zero. I know you may be thinking that's so unfair because there's only one sunk parameter and six adjustment costs, um, but that's what it is. Uh, um, also, sorry, but what I'm actually thinking is that from Das, Robert and Taibout, that uh, the way they identify the sunk costs is the difference in size between the firms that leave exporting and those that enter exporting, the ones that enter exporting are larger and they really take a long time after several negative productivity shocks before they leave the export market. Hmm. You don't have any moments on those lines that potentially could be um, informative about sunk costs. Right, I don't. And I didn't actually know about how they identified that. So that's really helpful. So thank you. Thank you. I mean, we do, we do have the, um, the flows from export to non-export, but we're not looking anything about size or productivity of those who make that transition. So that's great. Okay, Thank I'll you. put the Thank reference you. in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, actually I know all, all three of them pretty well. So it's a bit embarrassing that I didn't know that. So thank you. They are your colleagues. <laughs> um, so, so this is the no sunk and then the no AC cuts off all the adjustment costs. <clears throat> if you look at the fit, you can see the deterioration, certainly for the state control guys, is kind of small when we cut off the sunk costs. Um, not so if we cut off the, um, the adjustment costs. And over here, um, you get a deterioration, which is, which is larger from killing off the sunk costs. But again, it's the, the adjustment costs that, that, that really sort of seal, um, seal the deal here. And here you can see how the parameters change because this, so I should say, when I do each of these columns, it's a re-estimation, it's not a simulation. So in other words, when we kill the sunk cost here, we're allowing the adjustment cost to kind of pick up, you know, the difference, so to speak, and, 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 and they do. And when we kill the adjustment cost, we're allowing the parameters to, to all change. I, I won't go through this in detail beyond saying that the reason why um, the adjustment cost killing them just basically kills the estimation is that the model certainly struggles to get after this, these labor moments here. We're generating some job creation and job destruction precisely through the entry and the exit associated with the exit with, with, with the export market. But to get that, we're just, we're just sort of killing other, other dimensions. And you can see uh, we're not getting any inaction whatsoever which is a key feature um, of the data. So <clears throat> that's why down here, um, I said that the labor adjustment cost of fit worsens dramatically. Um, this is not technical parameters are wild, just trying to match uh, the labor moments, but without the trade frictions, um, the labor adjustment friction somewhat substitute for the, for the trade costs. And so George, this is the figure I wanted to show you earlier um, what this is showing is that on the vertical axis is, is, is the employment growth rate, and on the horizontal axis is the year since um, you became an exporter. Oh, so maybe this goes a little bit towards the DAS 
that in a Robertson tie bout thing. It's just that we didn't use this in the estimation. This is showing, again, for entry into export, what your employment growth looks like. Um, the left column is the state controlled enterprises data and model, and the right side is the private guy's data and model. Um, and you, part of the point is just to say, you know, in the data, you're getting a burst of employment associated with becoming an exporter. So instead of having CHI, the labor adjustment cost kind of substitutes for the cost of becoming an exporter, when that's a time in which you have large employment growth. And you do here in the, in, in, in the data. So I know this isn't the Rule Willis point about revenue shares and stuff, but this is our, our version of what it means to be a, a young exporter um, in the model and in the data. And again, we weren't trying to match these dynamics, but it looks like we, looks like we did pretty well. Yeah. Oh, except for ways in which we didn't. Okay, so we push on. Um, <clears throat> I want to tell you it's just something we did that I'm super excited about, but we don't have time to talk about. So I've actually written papers on um, education, whether people go to college or they don't go to college. And a, a common thing to do in that literature is to talk about mismatch. Really smart people who didn't go to college and people like me who should have been like, you know, whatever, and ended up going to college, undermatched and overmatched. And we use the same kinds of tools in our paper to look at export status. Those who are predicted to be exporters based upon fundamentals who didn't become exporters and those who did become exporters who were predicted not to be as a measure of mismatch in, the, in these distributions. And we sort of use that kind of as a quantitative tool to go beyond looking at the graphs that, that I showed you to, to motivate what we did but we'll have to skip all this wonderful stuff um, and push on to what I think is kind of the main point of the paper, which is determining export status, answering the question of who are the, who are the exporters. <coughs> so in the remaining 10 or so minutes, I'll try to talk a little bit about each of these, um, each of these bullet points. So first of all, um, I think actually, I've seen this regression in Colombian data, uh, recently, we ran a regression to look at the dynamic determinants of, of export status. Again, split by ownership, both in the data and in the model. And we weren't trying to match this. This is not in a set of moments we're matching. This is part of that informal over-identification. So, you know, it's customary to see that lagged export status matters with the coefficient of about 0.8. It's a little bit higher in the model than in the data, but, but, but not crazy. Size matters. So everything else the same, bigger, bigger, bigger plants in the previous period are more likely to be exporters um, today. That's understated in the model relative to the data. And then epsilon is um, <coughs> the innovation to this measure of, of profitability that I'm gonna introduce um, in, in a moment. This is like a responsiveness regression that might co-author John Haltywanger likes to run, where you look at investment or employment as a function of an innovation. Here, it's the responsiveness to, in terms of export status. And a little bit surprising to me, honestly, we're more responsive in the model than in the data. And one of the key features that determines responsiveness actually is, are the adjustment costs. And with the adjustment cost, you tend to be, it tends to mute the response. And I thought, okay, we got so much going on on the adjustment cost side, we'd be you know, muted in terms of the response to epsilon. Turns out that, that that's, that's not the case. Okay, so um, what we do is then we run various experiments, including those here, where we cut off the, the frictions, the adjustment cost and the sunk cost, and see what they do to these various metrics of what's determining trade status. So here, <coughs> here, for example, the dynamic is much reduced in the absence of either adjustment cost or sunk cost. The lagged effect was, was about 0.8 up here, right? And, and, and it's reduced. Um, also, the lagged employment doesn't matter as much. And of course, without these frictions, you end up being more responsive to, to the innovations, okay? So that's what these, these frictions are doing. Um, okay, <coughs> so profitability. I mentioned this a couple of times. Um, basically, what we have are these estimated um, revenue functions, and we want to measure how profitable these 
plants are either in domestic sales or in a combination of domestic and, and, and foreign sales. As I said before, I meant to say before, it's a little bit like backing out a solar residual in a heterogeneous plant um, kind of environment when you're selling to, to, to multiple markets. Um, so we can back out a measure, a plant specific measure of profitability and can a bit like what I did with Haltywanger and compare it against the average revenue product of labor. One is an exogenous measure, one is an endogenous measure, but they're very highly correlated in the data and also very highly correlated in the model. Again, in the absence of frictions and, and with um, in an absence of heterogeneous markups, the distribution of the average revenue product of labor would be degenerate, right? Everybody would have the same because everybody would just pay the same wage and then marginal revenue is equal to the marginal cost and blah, 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 okay. Um, in fact, when we look at the distributions of the average revenue product of labor, we get the same kind of sorting that we saw earlier with the average, sorry, when we look at the profitability measure, we get the same kind of sorting as we saw before with the average revenue product of, of labor. And the model and the data look very, very um, similar. So, so Sam, I know you had a question about this, which I put off. So, so here's another time to ask, uh, to ask that question. But let me just say, so <coughs> the top row here is from the data. The bottom row is from the estimated model. And you can see that we basically get more sorting on the state controlled enterprises, both in the data and in the model and much more of an overlap um, on, the, on the private side. Yeah, you know, for the model, we have some large exporters here, some very profitable ones who are, who are the exporters, but you know, in this group here, we have actually plants who are not so profitable, sorry, who are profitable, who are not exporters, uh, they're the non-exporters. So you don't get as much um, sorting on the private side as you do on the public side. And I'm about to discuss um, why that why that in fact is is the case but you know these look a lot like the the average revenue product uh figures that we that we saw earlier what we do in terms of um the experiments is we <coughs> turn on and off the adjustment costs turn on and off the demand shocks and um turn on and off the trade frictions and that's um that's what you could you can see here so the, the, first, um, the first row cuts off all the adjustment costs. And if you look, the black stuff is way to the right now compared to the white stuff, right? So you get, you get much more sorting there. It's also true here, um, although not nearly as much, when you get rid of the demand shock, so the only thing driving the export decision stochastically are the productivity shocks, you get a lot of sorting for the state-controlled enterprises. Um, a bit more for the private guys, but nothing like any with the adjustment costs. And when you get rid of the sunk cost, um, this is all simulation, by the way, so not re-estimation, just setting it to zero. You get a little extra sorting, but, 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 but not that much at all. The action seems here um, in the adjustment costs. Um, we also look at employment distributions. We recognize employment distributions are endogenous. Reflecting what? Well, reflecting the shocks, the shock processes, the curvature of the revenue functions, and all of these um, adjustment frictions. But there are interesting differences between the SCE and the PCE. Um, there are relatively a large number of small PCE exporters, private guys with a relatively small share of exporting and a relatively small um, workforce. And you can see that here. <coughs> in this employment distribution. So let me make this a little bit larger. Um, so for example, here, we're looking in the data at the state controlled enterprises. Here we're looking at the size, so over 1900 workers. And this is the percentage of the exporters and the non-exporters in these various cells. And you can see there's a whole block of very large exporters, um, not the case on the PCE. There's a whole bunch of exporters here that are actually relatively small, um, relatively small um, in size. And we capture that um, distribution um, in the model. Again, it's not targeted, but it is something that, that we get. And then here we go to some of the experiments that I mentioned before, getting rid of the adjustment costs, 
and getting rid of the demand shocks. Um, remember up here, <coughs> the PCE, there were just a lot of small guys, not a lot of big guys, but we recover that over here um, when we get rid of the adjustment costs. Then all of a sudden we get a bunch of big exporters contrary um, to the data. So this is what's you know helping to pin down um, those estimates. Okay, I think I'm, I have time for just a little bit more. And so the last thing I want to kind of talk about, which takes up a lot of the paper, but obviously can't take up much of this presentation time, is the effect of ownership. So we stressed this at the beginning, and I've already mentioned that there are a couple of key differences between the SCEs and the PCEs, um, adjustment costs, discount factor, but also the curvature um, of the revenue functions. The PCEs, if I remember, have more market power um, domestically. And this matters for the relative size of exporting and, 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 and non-exporting um, firms, plants. So what we do to study the effects of ownership is actually four exercises, which obviously I won't have enough time to go through. But the first thing we do is we replace some of the state controlled enterprise plant parameters with PCE parameters. We do this kind of one by one, and then we don't um, do any additional estimation, but we just let the state controlled enterprises re-optimize using, for example, the, the PCE discount factor or the PCE adjustment costs. And then we look at the moments and see kind of which moments change a lot and which moments don't change very much. <coughs> if we give the stochastic process for productivity and demand from the PCE to the SCE plants, we get huge changes, huge changes in, in behavior, moving us far away from the SCE moments. If we do that with the curvature of the revenue function and adjustment costs, we get some effects. Trade frictions, we, we, get, we get very little. The other thing we do is we look at the profitability distribution. And it's clear that we get much more sorting of the state controlled enterprises with the PCE parameters, which is a bit odd because PCEs were not sorting very well, but, but, the, but the state controlled ones do much more with the PCE parameters. Um, and, then, and then I'll just jump to the last point. We end up looking at export shares, something that we hadn't looked at prior to this in the paper. Um, but let me just show you those, those figures, just jump to those. Yeah, so these are the these are the export shares. So this is the distribution of export <coughs> shares across the plants. And so you can see for the state controlled enterprises, most of them who export actually have a very small share of revenue coming from export activities. The PCE, you've got almost 40% of the plants who are getting, you know, over 95% of the revenue from export activity. And again, the model reproduces that. This is not something that we targeted, but it, but it does reproduce that. And then if you ask what's driving it, um, so <coughs> these are graphs where we take the PCE alphas or the PCE shocks, and we give them to the state controlled enterprises. And we're asking what would have an effect on the distribution of the export shares. In particular, what would cause this tail, the right tail to appear as, as it does here for the private guys. And you can see we get a bit of it if we give them the shocks, but if we give them the, the curvature, the market power, so to speak, then we get a large fraction of workers, a large fraction of the ex, a large fraction of the exporters with a big share of their revenues coming from, from exports. Okay, I think I'm done out of time. Um, so let me conclude. We asked really the question, what determines trade status for Chinese manufacturing plants? Um, we started with a graph, two fig a figure showing graphically the, the distribution of the average um, revenue labor product. We saw a lot of overlap. We did not see a degenerate distribution. Um, the, the lack of degenerate distribution could come from adjustment costs, and we found that they were very important in the estimation, along with demand shocks. We found that the adjustment cost could 
to a large degree um, substitute for, for trade frictions. Let me just say, in an estimated model where on the table we have both labor moments and trade moments. I didn't mention this, but one exercise that's ongoing right now says, well, what if we just have the trade moments and not the labor moments? Then to what extent do the labor adjustment costs help match the trade moments? And how does it compare against the sunk cost model? We're there soon. And then <coughs> I kind of hinted at this before, we sort of got into this project because we want to do a quantitative analysis of the then ongoing trade war between the US and China, but not looking at the effect on US plants, but looking more at the effect on Chinese plants. And then we thought, well, we ought to understand um, what the effects of the alleged subsidies to the state controlled enterprises were actually doing to trade on the extensive and the intensive margin. And now we're finally set up to do that. And then the idea is to ultimately embed this in a, this being the estimated um, Chinese manufacturing plants in a model <coughs> where we look at the impact of US trade measures on what's happening in the Chinese plants. And that's, that's where we're kind of going next with this. So um, I don't know, thanks a lot for being there. And I guess it's customary for me to have some Chianti and you guys to ask more questions. I have a question when you have a moment. Yeah, go ahead. I, yeah, go ahead. In looking at the role or the economic power of the PCEs, to what extent did you factor in the personal relationship with the government? I'm thinking about manufacturing companies owned, for instance, by Lee ka and his family and by uh, uh, Peter Wu and his family. I guess I would these are not. people who have direct, powerful influence with the leaders of China and have for the last 30 years. And they have many manufacturing plants across the country. Yeah, that distinction, Guan Liang, you want to say something? That distinction is not something that I, I mean, put historically, we see this in earlier developing countries like Brazil, it was an right. important factor in the 1960s and 70s in Brazil. But in China, especially, I would think this would be very important in constructing such a model. So what do you think, so let me just ask you, so what do you think these connections would actually do? Easier access to credit, easier access to exporting opportunities? Well, for instance, uh, at beginning around 1997, um, China had a policy that said, if you want to uh, manufacture in China and you're coming across the border, you need to export at least two thirds of your production out of the country. And more and more when uh, overseas firms that were partnering in with Procter and Gamble and others to make all forms of consumer goods were doing this, if the, if, if the, if the uh, owner fa uh, controlling family of the PCE had direct personal immediate access to the paramount leader of China, they would get all kinds of favoritism including 25 year patent protection on any innovations that they had, which would certainly be a distance, which would give them competitive advantage in all sorts of economic ways. So do you think that those, I mean, this is a great comment, I much appreciate it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just trying to understand the, the force of it. So do you think that those, those ties are still present and strong in the sample that we, we're looking at? 2005, so present and strong across every aspect of Chinese manufacturing. Yes. Okay. So look, can I ask a, a related question, I guess, uh, from the other side, which is all, uh, you know, any of the government uh, state owned enterprise, you know, goodies that they're getting from the government. I think in both cases, I mean, so what, all of this stuff just kind of gets loaded into your revenue function estimates or something like that? I mean, if whatever's out yeah, there, you're yeah, picking up yeah. somewhere. So where, where do you think that stuff's showing up? Yeah. That's showing up in your... So, so in your... here, Kim, when I talk about quantify the effects of the subsidies, yeah, <laughs> we're thinking... I was going to ask you about that because you have no subsidies in your model. Well, I think, but this partly goes back to your question, right? You can think about the, the, the differences in, in, the, in the impatience as representing subsidized credit in various ways. And we could think about um, maybe export subsidies as appearing in something in the revenue function and maybe in the, in the, in the cost of becoming an exporter. 
That's how we would think about introducing the subsidies. So if you said, are they there? I would say, yeah, they're underlying some of these parameter estimates and so forth. We just haven't singled them out yet. Yeah, that, I guess, yes, that was, I guess, one of the questions I was going to ask you when you had this slide up, which was how you deal with subsidies if you don't have them. Is that also kind of what you were trying to get at when you said, let's take the state firms and give them the PCE, yeah. what did you give them, demand functions or something like that? <coughs> and shock. Was that sort of the nature of that experiment you were trying to do? Like, let's suppose that the government stopped. So, so, so yeah, it would be as if, what if we stop the subsidies? and put them on the same um, level as the, as the private guys. And we're interested in what the effect of those subsidies are on the decisions of the state controlled enterprises. How responsive are they in their export status and the export volume and so forth to those various um, types of interventions. One reason why we haven't quite gone directly there too is once we start getting into some of this policy stuff, you might think having a general equilibrium structure would be more advisable. Um, in the earlier work with, with Guan and Ping, we actually split into two papers. One was an estimation exercise like this, and the second one was an analysis of job protection measures that China imposed after this sample, and that was cast in the general equilibrium framework. And we may end up in a general equilibrium world here as well. Okay. So I, I, I wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Um, I, I'm... I'm um, so the, the adjustment costs on labor, I mean, it, it's very clear. It comes out, plays a really important deal. But you could step back and think, is that the first order adjustment cost in this economy? Like, because what comes to mind is like a capital market friction. So one question is, is like, is there kind of evidence or something prima facie that pushes us to, to put in the adjustment costs on, on labor rather than thinking about something on the capital market or credit market? And then the second thing is, I mean, I guess you hinted at this too, is like made just so I, I understand what you guys have done is yeah. like, what, how do we think about the adjustment cost vis-a-vis -vis the labor market in China? And then the, cause it's very different than say in the United States or, or the year or Europe. Well, <coughs> so at the, at the beginning I said, here we are just focusing on the labor adjustment costs. There's been parallel papers that have been done of looking at capital adjustment costs in China, and, and obviously they're, they're present as well. Um, the Marco, the, the, the Fontani thing is, is, is sort of funny in, in reference to this in some ways, because years and years ago, um, I complained at an NBR Summer Institute about the fact that people were either doing labor adjustment costs or capital adjustment costs, and not both. And it needed to be done both. For some reason, I connected it with Fontani, and, and, and I agree with you in that way. I mean, presumably both are present. The problem is actually doing the computational side of things and potentially the identification. So I can take this model, and we did this in the, in the RAND Journal paper previously, and generate capital patterns in a setting where we have labor adjustment costs and see how well those actually match um, data observations and go back and forth in that. Um, but I'm not going to argue that there are, that the, I can't imagine that there are capital adjustment costs in China, just like, you know, we think there are capital adjustment costs in, in, the, in the U.S. <coughs> we think that the labor adjustment costs are apparent in China, some of them being kind of almost bureaucratic in some sense of having to get various permissions to adjust in particular to fire, uh, to fire workers and so forth. Um, and that, that pressure being even stronger on the state controlled side than, than, than the private side. And the other way, as I said, that we sometimes think about the quadratic adjustment cost is the quadratic is sort of a, a cost associated with varying the number of workers. And for stability, political stability reasons, the state controlled guys might be trying to stabilize employment. And that's one of the things we think we're picking up with the, with the quadratic adjustment cost. But I can't, I, I'll be honest, I cannot answer your question of what would happen if I estimated the model with both labor and capital adjustment costs, how would I identify them, and what types of results would we get? I, I, don't, I don't know. Right. Sorry to be rude. I, uh, to your, your point about the relative importance of the labor adjustment versus the trade um, frictions or mm -hmm. trade costs, why don't when you get rid of the 
uh, say, fixed cost of exporting, why don't you just get to a situation where everybody's an exporter and so therefore you're far from the data in that sense? Because I would think with that curve, you'd always <coughs> want to export just a little bit to take advantage of that curvature in the revenue so that then you'd be way, you'd be kind of blown out of the water in that dimension. So I would have thought both are gonna be important, but you're saying that only the late, that you don't do that. You're saying you don't do that badly with- Yeah, we don't know, do that badly. Um, so I think, I, think, I think, Sam, there's two things going on. One is I think that the fixed cost of adjusting the stock of workers, I, I understand I could export without changing the stock of workers, but, but that fixed cost is pushing me is, is acting a bit like that sunk cost. And second of all, remember when I say, I should be clear, when I say we get rid of the trade cost, we still have an overhead cost of being an exporter. I, okay, but I mean, that might be, I, I guess uh, maybe that one is the one that's really first order in the maybe. sense, otherwise okay. you'd never right. fit the fact only 30% are exporters or something. So you're, you're saying, what about the exercise of sending, of sending Kai to zero and also sending the, the, the overhead cost to zero? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it may be trivial in the end, but it did seem like it more is fair given that you're doing lots of different labor costs and then you were only doing the one of yeah. the trick. I, I used that term as a joke before about being fair by having six parameters and only one, but. Oh, I okay. took it very seriously. I know you did. You've always been such a fair guy. Okay. So, so can I follow up on that a little bit? Just, um, yep. I can sort of see how like export participation is not going to be very different when you get rid of the sub cost, but I, I think the macro dynamics following a shock are going to be tremendously different in the sense that um, once you go to a model where guys can like immediately um, kind of go into the export marketplace without um, the sunk cost kind of slows that down because it, it adds like a GE force that you have to give up a lot of aggregate resources to kind of do that. Um, you're going to get slow transitions. And then, um, so I, I think like, you know, in the steady state, it's not going to be a problem. But I, I, George, 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 sorry, sorry. So just to understand when you say slow transitions, what exactly do you mean? Is it, let me, let me this be, I think this trade. is, the, I think. On trade, if you did a trade liberalization, it would take, you know, 10 to 15 years to kind of get to the full transition of trade flows. And, and the trade intensity in this model would all of a sudden jump up. Um, and then the whole scale of the economy would change, not the export intensity. So can I capture some of the dynamic you're thinking of from this regression that I just put back up? No, this is, no. This is a statement about macro dynamics. Okay, so it's not the individual export status, it's, it's something more aggregate than that. It's, you know, if you don't have a sunk cost, I mean, if guys aren't investing in becoming exporters, I mean, I guess maybe um, if they're not, in, there's something that has to be accumulated that's destination specific. Here, you don't have anything that's destination specific. Um, right. And so that's going to have different aggregate implications. Um, right. So, okay. all right, let me think about that. But I actually had a different question because I also, if I could kind of go back to like your, um, PCE versus SCE and the alphas. Um, so in Dan Liu's paper, she, she made this point that, that uh, guys who are in, in this very labor intensive industry were much more likely to be um, pure exporters. Hmm. And so that, that lets me think that like, and then, you know, she can line it up where, you know, what's the share of pure exporters by the labor intensity of the industry. So it, it makes me wonder to what extent, like, you know, just having the PCE versus the SCE is, going to be the right way of thinking about these different alphas. I, I would have thought um, <coughs> that huge mass of guys, they could just be in a different industry with very different alphas. And that's somehow yeah, biasing some of the so, differences. Yeah, I hinted a little bit at this at the beginning when I said this wasn't driven by composition effects, but I didn't do anything to convince you that what I said was actually yeah. right. So, so in the paper, we do like a, a big sort of industry comparison thing. And then we actually do the estimation for, I think, three industries separately. Okay. Um, and we see much of the same patterns in terms of the lack of sorting and, you know, and, and, and so forth. Um, but I don't have, I don't have the slides uh, on that set up. Okay. 
Uh, Russell, I see my question about the productivity distribution mm -hmm. was my mistake in misreading which the state owned versus the private. I had those reversed. So I just went back and looked at it. So, cause your, your first picture does show that the productivity distributions look fairly similar in the, in the private. There's not much of a yeah. shift and that you come back to that at the end. So I think that yeah. answers my question. So, I'm just going back quickly to see, you sure I didn't mislabel it? I, no, I, I'm sure I misread it. Okay. You see here you have the lower productivity for the exporters in the PCE that corresponds to your histogram where it doesn't shift very much for the PCE, right. but it does for the SE. Okay. Good. Can I ask you about uh, productivity measures? So you choose revenue per employment, which uh, in value added per employment, which uh, I like in the sense that it's entirely model consistent that the marginal cost, that there's constant markups, as you said, on the marginal cost, but not on the average cost. So you get the average labor and uh, the total labor in the bottom. Um, have you tried to measure something of uh, the marginal revenue productivity in the data and see how <coughs> line up or it's not um, an entirely fair question, but I'm sure that if the locker were here, he would ask something about having methods to estimate the marginal revenue productivity. And yeah. Did you do anything about it? I mean, I mean, directly. So again, our functional forms, you know, the average and the marginal are sort of directly related by a parameter. So it, it you know, that's the usual trick that we do. So you're thinking if we moved away from our particular specification, what will we get? Uh, I guess a... my question is in the model, the marginal is constant, right? Because there are constant markups within the domestic market and then within the export market, the price to marginal cost is constant. Uh, sorry, I'm, I, don't, I don't think for us marginal revenue is constant though. It's not constant over time and it's not constant in a cross-section sense, right? right? The price to marginal cost ratio is constant, right? That's a markup. Mm, okay, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And the question is, yeah. did you try to, or is the model consistent at all with those measures of markups? I understand. I understand. I understand. Okay. So, so maybe I can just rephrase your question for a second. We could also just be computing the distribution of markups here and asking whether how the distribution of markups looks um, for exporters and non-exporters and so forth. Is that is that the, is that the point? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And if, if those measures of markups are consistent at all with the model, yeah. <laughs> they just often to, are not. Just to, They're just difficult for me to understand. Yeah, just a comment on this. I know the looker isn't here, but um, in some other work with Halty Wanker and Willis, we tried to look for between the 1980s and the 2000s, these changes in markups, um, going at it in much the same way of trying to estimate curvature of revenue functions at the plant level. Um, Thinking that normally those curvature measures are reflective of, of markups, right? In the standard in the standard setting, we don't see any changes in markups at all. So I don't know, I don't know how to put all that together, but I, but it, but thank you. It's a, it's an interesting question. So maybe we have to figure out a way to back out the distribution of markups. So Sam, you would think about the distribution of the average productivity as reflecting the distribution of markups, right? That's right. So we would explain your first picture yeah. by markup distribution. So that's what I, that's what, so has anybody tried to kind of write down a model where there's both the, well, like our labor adjustment cost explaining the distribution versus the heterogeneous markups and try to, to tease well, there out. there is those. that John, do you know that John Asker and others paper with, that's very nice on the adjustment costs, I think for capital. Ah. I don't know if they 
put, they, I don't know if they did a horse race, but they did a nice job of describing sort of the capital adjustment costs and the well, I think product. Vinky, Vinky Venetuarian and Joel David had this paper come out in the AR that was trying to, I think, like kind of decompose sources of capital. I think at least it was capital misallocation. And like yeah, what was okay. coming from the adjustment costs yeah. versus markups and so forth. So that's one one place to look. Okay, good. That would be that's helpful. Because right, we're and they had some this... critical things to say about John Asker's paper, even though I like John, but that's even more fun. Good. Okay, thanks for that. I have another bottle of Prosecco, please. Thank you. We had it sent over to you. Yeah, right. Um, okay. Uh, I have little questions to ask you. Do other people um, have other questions or otherwise we can turn off the stream and I can ask, people can yeah, ask uh, other questions, but 